Uh, some of you remem may remember um, Spencer Pearson. He was an intern a couple years ago, and this is uh, Spencer's older brother. The, uh, <laughs> thank you, John. Yes, the shorter uh, older brother, actually, which is super embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah, so it's, uh, I'm pleased to be able to share this uh, goofy project with you today. Uh, I hope you like it. And um, yeah, it'll give you a little bit of insight into uh, kind of my weird hobbies. And uh, I hope when I work with you folks, um, I'll get to learn about your weird hobbies. So, uh, so let's do this. Um, I'll talk about the game Set. Uh, just a, a quick show of hands. Who's, who's played the game Set before? Okay, and uh, I'm going to go over the rules real quick, um, just in case you haven't. We'll talk about, oopsie daisy, we'll talk about Mathematica, which is the programming language I used to, uh, to do this little project. And, uh, and then we'll get into the meat of the presentation, and then hopefully we'll have some sort of live demo here. This is my sophisticated test bed here, made from a, a mail order turkey. You can do, do this, get these frozen turkeys for Thanksgiving. And uh, <laughs> this talk is brought to you by, <laughs> um, and then, the, yeah, there's the game board in there with a little webcam here. Um, okay, but let's talk about the game Set. So uh, Set is a card game where you have these, uh, these little cards, and actually this is the travel version of Set. Um, the, uh, the real version of Set uh, uses normal sort of uh, bigger cards, but uh, when I cooked up this project I was actually traveling, so I'm using the travel version. And each card has uh, values for three categories. The color, like this one's purple, uh, it has purple shapes on it. The shape, these are ovals, but they could, be, they could be diamonds or squigglies. And then the number, the number of shapes on the card. So there's two on this card. And you got 12 of these cards out on the table. This is a full information game, meaning that everybody's looking at the same thing. Nobody has any secret information, like in poker or whatever. And uh, everybody's looking for sets of, uh, of three cards that satisfy the following property. For each of the categories here, the color, the shape, and the count, the three cards in the set have to all have the same value or all have different values. So for example, this is a set because for the color category, they're all the same. For the shape category, they're all the same. They're all squigglies. And for the count category, they're all different. They're all different, one, two, and three. This is a set because for the color category, they're all the same. For the shape category, they're all different. And for the count category, they're all the same. So you've got this sort of all or nothing kind of thing going on here. This is not a set, let's do it. So for the color category, they're all different, that's good. For the shape category, they're not either all the same or all different. You've got two of one and one of the other. So this fails the shape criterion. And then for the count category, they're all the same, so that's good. But it doesn't satisfy all three, so this is not a set. Okay, so that's the whole game. You're just looking at these things. When you see a set, you say set. The game sort of pauses. You point it out. Your colleagues uh, grunt with dismay. You get the cards. You get to keep the cards. And they're refilled from the deck. When the deck is empty and nobody can find any more sets, the game's over. Whoever has the most sets wins. That's the whole game. You can while away hours uh, on this game. I'm actually very bad at this game. I, I know people who are like prodigies of this game. You can just look at it and immediately see it. I'm very bad at it. Uh, oh, yeah? Okay. I wrote, I'm very bad at it, so that's why I wanted to make a computer do it better than I could. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's really kind of a twisted psychological motivation here, right under the surface. Okay, so that's the game set. Let's talk about a, a Mathematica. So, Mathematica is a programming language that was generated, that was uh, built in the mid '80s for. Um, for computer algebra, it was it was done sort of to do integrals and and derivatives and uh, and stuff like this, sort of a symbolic uh, computer algebra package. Um, but since then, the scope has expanded a lot, so it does a lot of other things now. And in fact, um, a funny story about Mathematica: it was Steve Jobs who was an associate of the inventor of Mathematica who suggested the name Mathematica back in the days when the only thing it was supposed to do was math. And that name is very catchy, but it's been a curse for the company now. The company is desperately trying trying to uh, get a bigger market share. It's trying to compete with companies like MATLAB. And so uh, the, the name Mathematica is a terrible curse for them because people think, oh, well, you just do math with that. I don't need to do math, therefore I don't need to buy Mathematica. The end. So they've actually tried to rebrand it. Now they call it the Wolfram language. So Wolfram, Stephen Wolfram is the guy who made Mathematica. You probably know, um, what is that, Wolfram Alpha, that website? That's powered by Mathematica but they're desperately trying to sort of shift the name, and that's, that's causing a lot of confusion within the company. I did a sort of an internship there, and it's also causing confusion among potential users. So, fun story um, of the desperation of uh, that company. So, Mathematica is a cool language. In case you've, you've never seen it before, this is what it looks like. The, uh, 
you know, you have sort of this weird kind of, there's, it's kind of a text editor, but it can do like a kind of fancy typesetting. So uh, up at the top here, the first input is, I want to solve the quadratic equation. ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Please solve it for x. And it'll spit out these, uh, the sort of the two solutions for x, the two solutions of the quadratic equation. Um, it's nice, the input and the output appear right next to each other. That's kind of nice. And uh, you can solve differential equations with d-solve. You can do indefinite integrals. So it supports some sort of nice math typesetting, which, uh, which is pretty handy. So uh, let me tell you now why Mathematica is pretty well suited for, for this particular project, because this particular project doesn't have a lot to do with math. It's more mostly like image processing. Um, we're dealing with, sorry, the little thing here. Zoop. Okay. Let me show you how we would use Mathematica to parse the image that comes out of the webcam. So here is the, uh, here's the setup in case you uh, can't see it. The uh, uh, electronic users in the cloud maybe can look at this. So we have this webcam here. It's pointed down at, this, uh, at the game board here. This is just delimiting the, uh, the bottom of the frame. And uh, the whole thing is happening in the janky cardboard box. So in Mathematica, um, you have this, uh, you know, you have this uh, the very blank, the blank front end. But, but you just call, uh, let's see, current image is a function that looks for whatever is the current imaging device on the, on the system and it pulls an image from there. So it's very easy to just get the image. And the important thing here to note is that this image displays directly in the Mathematica front end, in the IDE, and that's, that's convenient. It's, uh, it's nice, images are sort of first class citizens in Mathematica and you can copy and paste them and do all sorts of convenient things, crop them and drag and drop them. So you can treat them just like normal numbers and string tokens and so on. The other convenient thing is that it's very easy in Mathematica to make user interfaces. So there's a, there's a function called binarize. You give it a, an image and, you, and it will threshold that image. It'll essentially turn it into just a black and white image based on some threshold. What threshold do you use? Well, it can be convenient if you have some sort of user interface where you can drag a slider with it's the threshold and it will show you the result of that. So this manipulate function up here at the top is the function that essentially makes a little GUI for you um, where any of the variables in here that you specify can be little sliders in the GUI. So that's pretty convenient. And you can do the same thing for color correction. There's an image adjust function and you can drag the sliders around and look at how, you know, you can sort of do on the fly image adjustment. So that's pretty convenient. Um, I mean, uh, I, I guess, uh, yeah, so the question was, uh, are these GUIs sort of first class citizens? I guess, uh, I, they're, they're not like, um, they're not like, I don't know, specific data types, like an image, you know, they, they, they put a lot of work into making it images like a really seamless object in the language that you can use all over the place. And the GUIs, I guess, are sort of first class in the sense that they're super easy. It's like a one liner to create, to create a GUI that can, that can really, I mean, these GUIs are modifying images, but you can have a GUI that will um, dynamically update and make a slider for any arbitrary expression you want. So the, the function that Mathematica has, so the GUIs are very nice, but the function that makes it really valuable to, uh, for this project is this thing called component measurements. Component measurements, you give it a, 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 an image and maybe a mask, like an image mask, and you tell it sort of what things that you're interested about uh, extracting out. This image mask is going to specify certain components of the image that will, uh, that are, yeah, these are called components, and this, this function component measurements is going to measure them for you. And if you say, I just want to see the masked image, it will spit out all of these little sub-images that the mask has specified. And they're sort of arbitrarily labeled. The labels, the labels are essentially where do they show up if you scan down the rows of the pixels of the image. So that's really easy. It makes it really easy to just pull out those, uh, those images. You can do the same thing with each card. If you have the card, you can use binarize to make a mask, throw it over the fence to component measurements, and here are the individual blobs on the card. So in just a few lines, you can get, you can essentially parse down the, from the big image all the way down to get the individual uh, blobs on the card. So that's pretty convenient. Okay, so it takes about 100 milliseconds to, to do that, to grab the frame and to, uh, and to do the processing uh, of the cards and then process each card down into the symbols. So, and that's nice because once you do this, you can immediately find the count. That was one of the three things that we needed for the set was the count and then the color and also the shape. So we get that pretty much for free and that's very nice. Just to give you an idea of sort of where we're going, where we're going is we'd like to parse this image into a list of the cards where each card is like the count and the color and the shape. The count and the color and the shape. Here's one green squiggly, here's three red ovals and so on. If we can do that, then it's essentially a one-liner to say, please find me all of the triplets of these 12 
lists that have either the same or different first element, the same or the different second element, all the same or all different third element. So once we're here, you're essentially home free. And doing that computation, all the triplets, this is 12 cards, there's three uh, cards in a triplet, so 12 choose three is like 220. So it's really not that uh, computationally intensive to just exhaustive search all possible triplets. Um, okay, so really the more interesting thing for this talk is how do we do the color and the shape? Okay, so let's talk about color. There, in component measurements, there is uh, one of the things that you can measure about each of the components in the image is this median, the median RGB value of the image. So it looks at all the pixels and looks at their red components and finds the median of that list of numbers. Looks at all the pixels, looks at the blue, blue, uh, the green and the blue components, finds the median of those lists of numbers. So this is the median RGB value for that blob and this one and this one. And then, you know, if you had a transparent image, this could show up as some median alpha value. So this is very convenient. Right away, you can say, okay, if I wanted to make a classifier to classify the color of the blob, I could just pick like the max of this thing. You know, is it, mo you can see here, this is mostly red, so it's probably a red blob. So it might be, maybe it's mostly green, so that's a green blob. Maybe it's mostly blue. Now there's not a blue card, the cards are actually purple, but maybe that's okay. To try to get a sense of how much wiggle room we have here, you could actually plot for a given game board all of the, uh, all of the blobs in sort of an RGB color cube here, where this is pure red, pure green, and pure blue, and sort of see where do all the blobs lie. So for example, you can see that, the that with this particular color calibration, the cards are actually kind of dark green. Green is not pure green, but kind of dark green. And you could maybe, you would maybe use that instead of saying which one is, well, so if you were to pick just the green component, you would never really get to all the way green. You would get maybe halfway to green. And so if you, one way to classify, besides just looking at the max value of the RGB, would be to say, let's pick some candidate colors here that are the colors that they're supposed to be, like sort of dark red, maybe purple and dark green, and use those three um, candidate colors. And when you have a new blob that comes in, you just see which it's closest to. And this is kind of a, there's a classification algorithm called nearest neighbors, because you've got these like the three, you know, the three uh, classes, and you're just seeing which class a given blob that you're trying to classify is closest to. Um, and Mathematica has a function called color distance, which uh, computes essentially that distance in um, not the RGB color space, um, but in the LAB color space. I don't know what that stands for, but it's some color space that is supposed to be more reflective of uh, human uh, perception. Okay, so not too hard here. You just have some new blob. You see which, which of the candidate um, colors it's closest to. Okay, so at this point, we, uh, it seems like we're almost done. We got the count and the color. We're in good shape. We just got one more, um, but I've got another 40 minutes. So what the heck? <laughs> um, so it turns out that the, uh, that the shape is kind of the most interesting problem. Uh, classifying this as a squiggly and this is an oval, trying to see what happens if it rotates, if, you know, like you can't assume that they're all going to be nicely flat. Um, there's some interesting subtleties here, and uh, that's what we're going to talk about now. I should mention that, uh, that I started out by doing sort of the simplest possible thing, you know, like, uh, well, Mathematic has like a built-in classify function, and it's supposed to be able to handle things like images. So you can say, you can give it a list where this is an oval, and here's this is a squiggly, you've manually labeled these things, and it should be able to handle it. And it wasn't quite working the way that I wanted, and, you know, it, I thought it would be more fun to just sort of, uh, well, I tried to get that to work, and then I thought, ah, I should really roll up my sleeves and kind of experiment with this stuff myself. So I want to talk about sort of how classification works for kind of from a theoretical perspective, a high-level bird's-eye view. You have something that you're trying to classify. You're going to classify it into one of these, into an element of one of these sets, a diamond, oval, or a squiggly. And the first thing that you have to do is take this object, whatever it is, and boil it down into a feature vector. So you get to pick this feature extractor, this function that is going to turn your blobs into some vector of numbers. Like how many numbers? You get to pick. You're designing the feature extractor. N numbers. At that point, you then have to build a classifier that will, that will map that number, that feature vector, into one of the labels. It'll essentially label the, uh, you know, that feature vector. This classifier essentially partitions Rn, that space uh, of vectors, into uh, three different, you know, three pieces, three, into uh, three sets. And you build that classifier by handing it a labeled data set. So we have gone through and we've taken a bunch of squigglies and blobs and diamonds and looked at them and said, that's, an, that's a diamond, that's an oval, that's a squiggly, and labeled them. So we have their feature vectors, which we're going to figure out what is, the, what is a good feature vector. You have all their feature vectors and their true labels. 
And with that information, with all those, the, that true labeled data set, we will then train the classifier. So there's sort of two parts here, picking a feature extractor and building the classifier from the labeled data set. And that's what we're gonna talk about now. So feature selection, what kind of features should we use? Well, the component measurements function can measure a whole bunch of different things about the components. Um, in addition to the mask image and like the median RGB color like we were just talking about, it can also look at the rectangularity, and I'll tell you what that is, and this other thing called the convex coverage. So let me tell you what those are. The rectangularity is, uh, take the blob, put the minimal, po the smallest possible bounding box around that blob, and tell me what fraction of that bounding box is covered up by the blob. So in this case, the blob covers 49% of the bounding box, so the rectangularity of, the blo of that diamond is 0.49. Okay, the convex coverage <clears throat> is a similar concept. Uh, take this green blob here, this is not like from the game, this is just one I drew, um, and compute its convex hull. Now the convex hull is essentially, of a, the convex hull of a shape is another shape. This is the shape that you get if you were to like shrink wrap the original shape. So you sort of shrink wrap it, it fills in all of the little pits and dimples, and that's the convex hole, this whole big thing here. It's the original shape plus all of the dimples filled in. And the question, the convex coverage of this shape is, take the convex hole, what fraction of the convex hole is covered up by the original shape? In this case, it's 0.7 of the convex hole is covered up, 0.3 is the dimples. So uh, this shape has con convex coverage 0.7. Now you might be wondering something. You see these diamonds here and you see that they're like 0 0.85, 0 0.88 and so on. A diamond is a convex shape. In other words, its convex hole equals itself. It doesn't have any dimples to fill in or whatever. So these should all be one. So there's a question of how come it's not all one? And I think the reason is essentially pixelation. I think Mathematica is computing the convex hole by essentially the outer corners of all of the pixels. And all that little pixelation there is, are these empty gaps that is damaging the convex coverage. So we have to like worry about like does that mean that we're not going to be able to use these things as our two features or do we need to add more features or whatever. So we'll look at that in a second. So the main idea is you get these two features, the rectangularity and the convex coverage, and you look at them for the squigglies and you look at them for the ovals, and it's kind of hard to look at numbers so we can plot them. And here on the x-axis is the rectangularity, on the y-axis is the convex coverage, and this is great news. It looks like it's all pretty separable. It looks like in principle, like when I was first working on this, I thought, oh great, I can just use maybe the rectangularity as a single feature. If it's less than 0.56, it's a diamond. If it's greater than 0.67, it's an oval, and in between it's a squiggly. But you can see that it doesn't quite work. This diamond kind of screws it up, and these guys kind of bleed into each other. So you can't just use rectangularity. Maybe you need to use another thing. When you add another dimension, convex coverage, suddenly you can see that, yeah, maybe if I could find some sort of like slope here, some sort of line that's not just straight up and down, I could use that as a decision boundary. And in fact, what we're looking for is a, what we're going to build ultimately is a classifier that maps this region here to squiggly, maps this region here to oval, and maps that region there to diamond. So that's where we're headed. But there's a couple of questions that you might ask yourself before we get started, which is, what would we have done if the data set, the training, uh, the, um, the labeled data set was not linearly separable? What if the oval sort of went over here and the diamonds kind of went under them like this and it wasn't linearly separable? Is there some way around that? Because it's really nice, it turns out there's a lot of really nice algorithms for designing a linear classifier with linear decision boundaries. If it's not linearly separable, what do you do? Here's one thing you can do. Oh yeah, and let me talk about the second question, which is, um, are these features robust? If you have the feature set here, you know, maybe I didn't pick enough diamonds. Maybe the actual diamonds, if I took more and more diamonds, it would be a huge cloud of diamonds that would be all over the place. It would be way over onto the ovals and the squigglies and stuff. It'd be terrible. So that would be a danger too. We should figure out, you know, essentially get a bigger data set. But how can we make a bigger data set without, you know, I don't want to have to take pictures of this game board all day. Um, so how, what can you do about that to test the robustness of the features? So let's talk about the linearly separable thing. I'm not going to spend a long time on this because I, I think we're a little short on time. Um, but the basic idea is just add more dimensions. You, there, there's a couple concepts. You can add more dimensions. Here is the, here's another dimension to the data set. So this is like a 3D graph, the bounding disk coverage. So what that is, is it's like, like, it's like rectangularity. You have, this, you have the blob, put the smallest possible circle around the blob, and ask what fraction of that circle is covered up by the blob. That's the bounding disk, and you're asking its coverage uh, of the blob. And you can see that ovals, oh, so, okay, let's start like this. Diamonds are very long and pointy. Um, you, the, uh, they're not going to cover up very much of their smallest possible circle. So they're going to have a small bounding disk coverage. 
Ovals are pretty round, they're almost like circles, and so they're gonna have a, a big bounding disk coverage. And so you can see that adding this additional variable really splits out the diamonds and the ovals. Even if in the two-dimensional thing they sort of snaked around each other, in three dimensions, some of them would be way over here, some of them would be way back there, and you could find a very easy linear decision boundary. So that's the, that's the trick. There's another trick called lifting, which is like adding another dimension, but you're essentially um, like adding new dimensions that are based on the ones that you already have. So like maybe rectangularity squared plus convex coverage squared. If you added that as an additional third component, maybe that weird sort of polynomial in your existing measurements would be something that would make it separable. That's what li lifting is. Okay, and for the second question, sorry, it looks like I threw up on the slide, but the, the basic idea is, um, I made a whole bunch of sort of high resolution shapes, like a, like a cyan diamond and a yellow oval and a magenta squiggly, and I made a whole bunch of you know, new images by rotating them around and rescaling them and so on, and I looked at where they were on this color cube, uh, on this um, feature, in this feature space. And I was excited to see that, so here's a bunch of like real, you know, real ones from pictures I took, and I was excited to see that, you know, the cyan diamonds pretty much line up with the pictures of the diamonds that I took, except if they're really, really low res. So here's the really low res diamonds and squigglies and stuff, and they sort of could end up anywhere. But as long as they're not too low res, I mean, and you would even have a tough time sort of classifying this, like these eight pixels, is that a squiggly or what is that, <laughs> you know? So uh, as long as you don't go too low res, it looks like these blobs are generally linearly separable. That's good. Okay, so that answers those two questions. Is it robust? And what do you do if it's not linearly separable? Okay. So we're pretty much done with this part. We've picked the features for our feature selection. The rectangularity and convex coverage look at first blush like they would be able to make a, uh, our training set linearly separable. Let's talk about now the classifier. Oh, and I should point out that the labeled data set here um, now has this form. Once you lock down that you're working in R2, that that's your feature space, your labeled data set is gonna look like this. Here's the rectangularity of some shape and its convex coverage, and here's the, and here's the label that you manually identified. Here's some other blob, is do things and it's and it's labeled too. So that's what your da labeled data set's gonna look like, just so you can have that in your mind. So let's talk now about how to take this and create a function that will map points in the plane to uh, elements of this set, diamond, oval, or squiggly. And we're gonna be using a technique called multinomial logistic regression. Um, I don't like that name, I think it's really weird sounding, um, but I guess if you work in the biz, then then that would make sense to you. <laughs> but, but it certainly didn't make sense to me. And this is the part where we're designing the classifier. Okay, so just a quick recap, what a plane is, we're talking about in 2D, so you've got two scalar variables, and a plane is defined by these three coefficients. Um, it's essentially a linear function of these two things plus a constant. And what this looks like, and so I just sort of whipped up a 3D plot in Mathematica with the manipulate sliders. You know, as you change A, that changes the whole plane up and down. As you manipulate b, b is the coefficient for x, and so that tilts the plane in the x direction. That's like the slope of the x. And then in the third dimension, c, c is the coefficient for y, and so that tilts the plane the other way. So you can sort of convince yourself that by wiggling these three things, I could get sort of any plane that I wanted. Um, yeah, and I should point out that um, in case you're ever going to uh, do multinomial linear uh, logistic regression over more dimensions, if, in case you had rectangularity and convex coverage and a bunch of other features, um, this you would have to get comfortable with this idea that you can express a plane as a row vector times a column vector. This is, uh, this is essentially the plane, this is your feature vector with this little extra one here for the offset. So if you ever look this up on Wikipedia or something, you're going to see a lot of like linear algebra expressions and they're not going to talk about planes. So don't think that I'm like lying to you. It's just they're using kind of a more generalizable math. Okay, so the big idea, you know, let me talk, this is the most important slide. The big idea behind this classifier is we're gonna make three planes, one for each shape. Sorry, I said affine function here, that's a fancy way of saying plane. I meant to change in this slide five minutes before and I didn't. So we're gonna pick planes for each shape. Those planes, so here we have a, a yellow plane for the diamond, a blue plane for the oval, and a green plane for the squiggly. And the basic idea is these planes, in some sense that we're gonna uh, determine, these planes are like the probability of uh, a point on the feature space having being that shape. So these planes, so when the plane is very high up here, that means sort of high probability, very likely that it's, for example, a diamond. On this way over in that corner of the feature space, it's probably a diamond. Let me, here's an example. So, Suppose you measured, a new blob came in, 
And the blob, you measured the blob, and it had rectangularity 0.8 and convex coverage 0.8. And you'd like to classify that blob. What do you do? Well, you look at where that 0.8 lives on this plane, and this plane, and this plane. And I picked the corner so that you could easily see where the planes are. You could evaluate 0.8, 0.8 for each of the planes. So you see that it's the green one here. It's the green one, is bet which is the squiggly's plane, is bigger than the blue, and it's bigger than the yellow. So you would conclude that 0.8, 0.8, this blob that came in that has these, that, that feature vector is probably a squiggly. That's how this classifier will work. And you might be thinking, you know, Justin, if you're only picking the biggest plane at each point in the feature space, then you really just care about what it looks like from the top down. Because if you look at it, oh yeah, sorry. And so here's the math. So it's just like the argmax. So it's the biggest index of these three planes. So you're going to look at these, you evaluate the point in the, the feature vector at these three planes, pick the biggest element. So as I was saying, you really just care about what's who, whichever plane is on the top, because that specifies what your classifier is going to pick. So if you rotate this big, all these planes around, and you look at it from the top, this is actually, these are your decision boundaries. So this is your feature space down here, you're looking straight down on it, and then this region here, that's gonna be, what, a squiggly, this region's gonna be a diamond, this region's gonna be an opal. And the reason I picked these particular planes is because this, these are actually the correct planes. As we're gonna find them, I'll tell you how to find them, but the idea is if you took your labeled data set and you pro projected it down, it would be correctly partitioned by the planes. Okay, that's the idea. So the big question going through everybody's mind now is, how do you find the three planes? How do you fit them to the data? Does that make sense? Okay, need a breath. Okay. <laughs> yes, please, John. Isn't it possible for one of, one of the shapes to fall exactly on all three planes equally? Yeah, like here. Yeah, yeah, I mean. Exactly, exactly. But you're right, I mean, these sort of anything that's on this, this oh, sorry, the question was, what happens if a shape is like right here? Like, is that bad? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And hopefully some sort of numeric round off or whatever would sort of kick you off of the, all the boundaries. Like, yeah, but you're right. I mean, these are sort of weak areas here. Yeah. Uh, so one way to try to find these planes is you could try to do it manually. So Mathematica, you can plot out stuff. Here's our three planes. Here's a bunch of sliders. There's, you know, sliders for ABC, the first plane, DEF, GHI, the other two planes. Here's what they look like. And here's the decision boundary, sort of from top down. And here are the symbols. And so as you drag around the different planes, here are the different parameters for the planes. I'm moving the green plane up and down. And you can see that's changing the decision boundary. That's essentially changing what it looks like from the top down. Don't worry about this thing in the middle. That's just sort of a rendering artifact. And so, you know, you can spend all day long wiggling these sliders, trying to make them so that the decision boundaries line up the way that you want. And it'll be a huge pain, and, uh, and it'll be really hard to do manually. So uh, let's not, uh, so what are we supposed to do? We can't solve it manually. Um, probability will come to the rescue. Um, against all odds, probability will help us out. So let me, let me now explain how we will take this problem of finding these three planes and express it in a probabilistic framework that will result in an optimization problem we can solve where the variables that we're going to be wiggling in the optimization problem are the, the parameters for the planes. Okay, so it's a mouthful, but stick with me. So here's the idea. Assume that given some point in the feature space, some particular point on the feature space, like 0 0.8, 0 0.8, suppose that just the, the way that the problem happened, it was, a probab it was probabilistic in nature, and at that point, there was some probability distribution of what, prob what was the probability of that point being actually a squiggly, or an oval, or a diamond. That's sort of what we were going for. These planes are supposed to be like the probabilities of it being a squiggly, or a diamond, or whatever. And, and that's what I was saying. These three, these three numbers would be the, essentially the probabilities. Now there's one problem, which is these planes could be any which thing. They could be pointing any weird direction, and a probability vector has to sum to one, and it has to be positive. So to fix this problem, to fix this problem that these three numbers might not add up to one and be all positive, we wrap a, a, the function softmax around it. Softmax is a function that takes a vector as input, and it provides a vector as output. I'll show you what that is. Um, it takes this vector as input, produces a vector of outputs, and the vector of outputs has the property that all the elements are positive, and they sum to one, just like we want a probability vector to do. How does it do it? Well, it raises e to each of the elements. So this is like e to the z1, e to the z2, e to the z3, and so on. So this is a vector. And then you divide it by the sum of all those things so that it sums to one. 
So that's all softmax is. Here's an example. Softmax of these three numbers yields these three numbers. And you can see that the biggest one here is two and a half, and the biggest probability here is 0.97. Everything sums to one and it's positive. So it's sort of, it's preserving the order of the elements, but it's scaling them essentially in this weird way. Here's the softmax of one, two, three, four, five. This is definitely not a probability vector because it doesn't sum to one, but it rescales them essentially and it keeps the order. Keeping the order is very important because if we're trying to think of these planes as being like the probabilities of the shapes, bless you, then, then we certainly don't want softmax to be shuffling around the, uh, you know, which one is, which index has the maximum. Okay. So this is the big assumption. Suppose that the probabilities of each shape for a given point um, are given by the softmax of this vector. So this is another vector of three things, only it's a probability vector. Okay, so for example, if you had some planes already picked out, and the planes were given by you know, a equals one, b equals two, c equals three, and so on. So these numbers, you plug them in, those give you three specific particular planes. And you wanted to figure out what's the probability that the point 0 0.8, 0 0.8 is an oval, like I'm gonna plug in this feature vector to this, uh, this feature vector to my planes here, get these things, and then I gotta softmax it. Well, if you softmax it, you get this vector of three things here. You can see the probability of being a diamond is like 10 to the minus seven, very small. Probability of being an oval is like, point, you know, like 0 0.004, very small. Probability of being a squiggly is 0.999. So, so what, this, what this is saying is for these particular planes, these planes would predict that if a blob comes into you with this feature vector, it's almost certainly a squiggly. Or said another way, if you had a blob that came in in your trained data set and you looked at that blob and you said that's an oval, let's see what my classifier says, the classifier would be really, really wrong. And that would be a sign that your planes are not set up right. Your classifier is broken. So uh, that's just an example of how, how you would actually evaluate the softmax um, for a specific set of planes and a feature vector. Okay, so with this assumption that this has this probability distribution, that the, that the shapes have this probability distribution with the softmax thing, then suppose you had a labeled data set. In other words, here's your rectangularity, your convex coverage, and some label. Um, so these are specific numbers like we were looking at at a previous slide. You had a labeled data set. The probability of that labeled data set, of you observing that labeled data set, is the product of every probability of each of the, of the items in the labeled data set, of each of the blobs. So this is the, prob the softmax uh, of, the, of the three planes is the probability of all the shapes, and you pick the index of whichever part of the softmax you observed, whichever shape you observed for that thing. So for example, if this is 0 0.8, 0 0.8, and oval, uh, then you plug in 0 0.8, 0 0.8, and uh, oval here is the, second, is the second element of the softmax, it's the second plane, and so you would pick the second element of this softmax. So, the, the really important thing to notice about this weird expression is that these, no, these are all totally specific numbers. They're, they're all numbers. These labels are essentially indices into the softmax. And the only like variables here are the variables of the plane, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. And that, so that sort of defines a function. So given some trained, uh, given some labeled data set, you can make this big expression that has as variables A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and everything else is just numbers that come from your training set. This is called the likelihood function because this is the likelihood of seeing this data set. Okay, and so what do we do with this thing? This likelihood function specifies sort of an optimization, we can specify sort of an optimization problem. Remember, we're trying to find the planes. We're trying to find the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. Given a labeled data set like this, we were just talking about with these specific numbers, find values for A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I that maximize the likelihood function. The likelihood function is the probability of seeing this data. We saw the data. Now we're trying to find planes that match the data, that would help predict the data that we saw, that we know that we, we saw. And a lot of times for numeric reasons, because these probabilities are typically very small, each one of these probabilities is kind of small, you're multiplying a bunch of small numbers, so to avoid numeric like round off errors, you typically take the log. So this is called the log likelihood. Um, now this, this technique is called maximum likelihood estimation. You have some, you're trying to fit a probability distribution essentially to a bunch of observed data. So that's the technique. 
In Mathematica, it's very easy to do this. I mean, it's very easy to do this. You can do this. There's lots of uh, like convex optimization packages, like optimi optimizers and stuff that will help you solve this. But here's how you can do it in Mathematica. Here's our trained data set. So there's the rectangularity, the convex coverage, and the, and the label. So this is a squig two means squiggly, three means uh, oval, uh, oval, yeah. And, uh, or maybe it's the other way around. The likelihood, we're just taking every element of the data set and we're doing the log, we're adding up the log of the softmax and we're indexing into it by what label it was. So this is just the same as the expression before, except I switched the times and the log. Now it turns into a sum. So it makes it a little bit more numerically tractable. And then you find the maximum of that. This is essentially the maximizer. And when you do that, you get some big long list of numbers. So this is the solution. This is the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. Now you might look at these and say, these are really big numbers. What's going on here? And what's going on here is, if you remember, the planes that we had, I could shift all of them up and it wouldn't change the classifier. It wouldn't change which one's the maximum. I could shift all of them down and it wouldn't change which one's the maximum for a given point. So I can sort of shift them all up and down like that. And that means that these A's, the A and the D and the whatever, there's a certain redundancy here where I can have multiple solutions that won't change the maximum of that likelihood function. So this is not like a unique solution. I could sort of scale everything down or scale everything up. All those, they would be equally valid solutions. But that's okay. That's okay. This is, you know, so this is, this is a candidate solution and it'll work. There's other ones. That's great. If you take these numbers and you plug it in as your planes, you get the, exactly the same thing. You get this classifier. You get these planes, which you could interpret as this classifier. And if you run it, and if you look at what it looks like in terms of partitioning your data set, it partitions your training set. So where do we start? Where do we end? We had a frame. We had to partition the frame to get all the little symbols, to get all the little blobs. We, we decided what was a good feature set. We decided the rectangularity and the convex coverage, these measurements of these blobs would be good. They would, they, they would be good to use for a classifier. And then we used maximum likelihood estimation to actually pick the parameters for the planes that, that parameterize the classifier. So, at this point, uh, I guess we're ready to try the demo. So before we get there, um, and I have five minutes, which is great. Are there any questions? I just want to jump in and see the demo. Please come to me with questions afterwards too. Yeah, Bryce. I'm just curious, did he use the number of pixels at all? That was yeah, I was a little worried about the scale. Like, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, 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 absolutely, thank you. Yeah, yeah, Bryce asks, um, what about just using the number of pixels as a, as, a, as a differentiator? Like an oval has a lot of pixels, a squiggly has not so many, and a diamond has even fewer pixels. Maybe that would be a good differentiator. And I totally agree that when you, are, when you have finished your janky you know, box, that's not gonna change dimensions, everything will be the same size. But at the very beginning of this project, I was worried about size, the, the scaling being a problem, yeah. Okay, so uh, you guys wanna see the, the live demo? <laughs> oh my gosh, okay, here we go. So, I have two things here. One is uh, sort of a live feed from the webcam. Uh, and I just use this for a, to try to get an idea. Let me see if I can make this a little bigger for you folks. Hmm. Okay. Well, actually it actually looks pretty good on that screen. So here's a live feed from the webcam. I can sort of go in here. You can see I'm waving my hand around. Okay, yeah, right? Um, and then way down at the bottom over here, I have the game. Uh, so I have, I guess this is the on off. I'm gonna set the, turn the debugger on. So the debugger at the very beginning will just try to parse all of the, ah, uh, there's gonna be, yep, okay. So it's very important to get the color calibration right. Yeah, okay, so I see the little numbers increasing here. So this is sort of giving me kind of a rough frame rate of theoretically how fast could this thing be pulling from the camera. And then you can see up here, this is sort of a much slower frame rate. It's only updating maybe every couple seconds. So this, uh, what this is doing is just right now in this debug mode is it's telling me what is the result of parsing out all these frames here. So I should be able to sort of screw it up if I put my hand down here um, and that'll, that'll uh, make it upset. It won't be able to uh, identify several of the cards. Does that make sense? Cool. So, when we turn it into, uh, when I turn off the debugger, we'll be in sort of set mode and it'll be looking for actual sets. Um, so here it's found, here's a set, diamond, squiggly, and oval. Yeah, right? <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> 
Uh, very good. That's like the most, yeah, that's the scariest part is the life demo. And here's another set, the oval, the squigglies, and this diamond. So it's on two different sets. Let me just show you that as long as I keep putting down cards here, you can sort of get a sense for how fast the machine is. Like, it takes a few seconds, and sometimes, sometimes uh, you know, my hand gets in the way, and so then it sort of screws up the, the classification. Does this make sense, what's what I'm doing? So when my hand's out of the way. So I think a, so a human would, would have sort of the real-time coverage of what's going on. The, the machine doesn't get, you know, it can't run as, uh, as fast. Yeah, you're welcome to come up and play around with it, unless we really want somebody. I see there's some goading happening here. No? Okay. Cool. Well, you're welcome to come up and play around with it. And, uh, you know, thanks for your attention. I look forward to, you know, meeting everybody in the future. So thank you.